Hey everyone, how's it going? Today I want to talk a little bit about the Black Hawk. Just the name Black Hawk invokes many, many things. From the bird simply known as the Black Hawk, which unsurprisingly is a black colored hawk, to perhaps most famously the UH-60 Black Hawk helicopter of Black Hawk Down fame, to the Chicago Black Hawks, a hockey team, to the US 86th Infantry, known as the Black Hawk Division. Now, probably because I don't really pay attention to hockey, I just kind of assume that these things were named after the bird. I mean, naming a helicopter after a bird, they both fly, it's just logical. But no, all of these things, minus the bird, are actually named after a Native American chief named Black Hawk who fought on the side of the British against the United States in the War of 1812, and who led a group of natives in the so-called Black Hawk War in 1832. Now, considering that he was basically considered to be an enemy of the United States all the way back in the day, it initially seems a little odd that so many American military things and just American things and places in general would be named after him. But after the Black Hawk War led to his capture and arrest, Black Hawk was essentially paraded around the United States and kind of became a bit of a spectacle. And towards the end of 1833, Black Hawk told his life story to a government interpreter, and this was then in turn published into an autobiography that became a bestseller. Combine this with later historical and moral analysis of America's westward expansion and the treatment of the natives, Black Hawk essentially became something of a folk hero, a brave, honorable man who stood up and fought for his people. Now, a lot of that is just a cursory glance at his history, and most of that I'm just now learning for the first time, actually. But when you use a revered person's name for something, whether it's to name a school, a park, a town, a sports team, or a piece of military equipment, you should probably make sure that thing ends up doing well. Like, you don't want a school named after Albert Einstein to have the worst test scores in the country or something like that. This then brings us to our subject for today an aircraft named after Black Hawk, but not the helicopter that you're thinking of. Instead, we have a jet fighter from the post-World War II era that really did a disservice to Black Hawk in that it failed and basically brought the end to what was once a respected aircraft company, or at least an end to their aircraft production wing. This is the Curtis Wright XP, or XF-87, Black Hawk. Its story begins towards the tail end of World War II with a Curtis project known as the XA-43. Not that much information still exists concerning the XA-43, but from the bits and pieces I could find, it was either a twin-engine or four-engine ground-attack aircraft, armed with a number of 50 cal machine guns and multiple bomb bays. This design was short-lived, however, either due to issues in procuring engines, either two or four General Electric J-35 turbojets, or due to issues in the design's estimated range, and the XA-43 design was cancelled in 1945, shortly after it was initially approved. However, Curtis basically got to keep the money that had been earmarked for the XA-43 after a new design competition was initiated by the U.S. Army Air Corps for an all-weather interceptor, or as the title all-weather actually entails, a night and poor weather fighter. To this new competition, Curtis designed a plane that was technically different than the XA-43, but was, generally speaking, just a slightly modified and improved one, measuring in at 19.15 meters long, 18.29 meters wide, and 6.1 meters tall, the XP-87 was a relatively sleek and relatively unique-looking multi-engine fighter. 
the overall shape of the fuselage resembled other early jet fighters, like the FH Phantom, F2H Banshee, and F9F Panther. And taking the wings out of the equation, the XP-87 with its tricycle landing gear and high T tail, it looked like a pretty nice and normal jet fighter. But add in the wings, the cockpit, and the proposed armament, that's where the design started getting a little more weird. Up in the relatively small cockpit was a crew of two, and they would be sat side by side, so I hope they were friends and got along with one another. The initial armament for a late World War II, post-World War II, heavy fighter adjacent design was incredibly light and wholly insufficient, probably in an effort to improve defensive capabilities and reduce weight, the initial armament was just four 50 cal machine guns, two in a remote-operated nose turret, and two in a remote-operated tail turret, and there would be an unspecified number of rockets held somewhere, probably under wing. This was later revised to four fixed forward-firing 20 mil cannons, which was much more in line with the era. But probably the most interesting element of the design over in the wings would be the four jet engines, to be four Westinghouse J-34s with 3,000 foot-pounds of thrust apiece. These four engines would be condensed into two separate mid-wing engine nacelles that were pretty blocky and square-looking, instead of being round like normal. I'm not too sure why they made the nacelles this way, but at least it looks different and kind of neat. In an alternate setup, instead of the four J-34 engines, due to an anticipated shortage of them, the XP-87 would be outfit with either two Allison J-33s or two General Electric J-47s, with 5,400 and 6,000 foot-pounds of thrust apiece, respectively. The alternate XP-87 with this setup received a separate designation as the XP-87A. At least in the case with the two J-47 engines, the overall performance of the A model would, at least in theory, be equal to, if not slightly better than the baseline XP-87. The dry weight of a single J-47 engine just about matched the dry weight of two J-34s, while taking up less area overall. So ideally, with the J-47s, there would be a little bit less drag and thus better performance. Curtis's work on an initial mock-up would proceed relatively smoothly, and by May 14, 1946, it was presented to the Army Air Force for inspection, and they were presented with an interesting mixed bag. Gone at this stage was the initially proposed set of twin 50 cal turrets, but instead of the fixed forward-firing 20 mil cannons that would later be adopted, Curtis initially decided to try a happy medium, and up in the nose would be four 20 mil cannons, but in a turret. This would give the XP-87 a much greater field of fire over your standard fighter. But I do question Curtis's decision to try and promote this armament setup. At this stage, it was already well established that the whole turret fighter concept didn't really work. While it may have been a little bit better than those turret fighters that served in the war, in part due to the location of the turret, the XP-87's proposed setup here was just incredibly gimmicky, and it isn't surprising whatsoever that it was later altered to just four fixed 20 mil cannons. Beside that turret, the side-by-side -side pilot setup would have the added benefit of freeing up additional space in the fuselage for more fuel, which would help increase the range of the design up to around a thousand miles. However, also in the cockpit, the Army Air Force was a bit disappointed with how the cockpit was laid out overall, and it made it kind of look like Curtis didn't have that much care in the overall design. The design also apparently had a bomb bay, 
although I couldn't actually find anything on what its capacity would have been, and apparently the Army Air Force was dissatisfied with how it was made or laid out. These faults force Curtis to go back to the drawing board for a little bit, and combine with the general slowdown in military development after the war came to an end, it wouldn't be until 1948 that the first prototype was completed, and in early February the plane would be loaded up and shipped over to Murak Dry Lake, where Edwards Air Force Base currently resides, for its initial flight testing. As the Curtis factory was in Columbus, Ohio, and Murak was over in California, the XP-87 had quite the travel ahead of it, and again, I couldn't find the specifics, but in that cross-country journey, the XP-87 apparently got into two different car accidents. Not serious ones or anything, but using context clues from what little I could find, I think there may have been several instances where the truck carrying the XP-87 encountered a low bridge or small tunnel that couldn't fully fit the aircraft through it, which led to a couple of incidents. But again, these weren't serious, and on March 5th, 1948, the XP-87 took to the air for the first time. And just like how the initial mock-up was a bit of a mixed bag, the actual initial flight performance of the XP-87 was a mixed bag as well, because of its four engines, despite the fact that the XP-87 had a staggering gross weight of 49,900 pounds, nearly as heavy as the B-24 Liberator, it still showcased a top speed of 600 miles an hour at sea level, which was solidly fast, but also a little bit slower than they anticipated. Still, it had solid speed for its size, and its overall flight characteristics were considered to be solid as well which is actually a little bit odd, considering the initial issues in the design. For one, above either 220 or 300 miles an hour, or just at a third or half of its top speed, the XP-87 started experiencing some buffeting issues, or vibrations in the wings and frame, indicating some kind of aerodynamic issue. Additionally, likely due to its immense weight, the XP-87's maneuverability and climb rate were both pretty poor, with it reaching 35,000 feet in 13 minutes and 48 seconds. Compare this to something like the F-86 Sabre, which admittedly was about a third of the weight, that would reach 30,000 feet in just 5 minutes 12 seconds. Despite these issues, though, the performance was actually considered to be good enough to warrant full-scale production models. Aware, though, that the four J-34 engines were now both underpowered and overly heavy for how much power they output, the production models were to be fit with the J-47 engines as standard, and as the classification system for aircraft was altered around this time, the XP-87 became the XF-87, and the order would be for 57 F-87As and 30 RF-87As, the R being used to classify it for photo reconnaissance. This order wouldn't last terribly long, though, and in mid to late 1948, the XF-87 would go head-to-head -head with the XF-89 Scorpion and the XF-3D Sky Knight. While none of the participating aircraft really turned heads performance-wise, as the XF-89 suffered from initial issues being underpowered, and the XF-3D just kind of inherently was small and underpowered. But of the three aircraft, the military came to the conclusion that the XF-89 was the best of them, and had the most room to grow and improve, and the XF-87 was considered to be the worst of the three. As a result, in October 1948, the XF-87 project was cancelled, 
with just one full-scale production model having been completed. A second half-made production model would be scrapped, and by 1949, the only two completed models, the production model and the prototype, were scrapped as well. So ultimately, the lesser-known Black Hawk ended up as a complete failure, and certainly did not honor the name and legacy of Black Hawk. And this failure ended up being the end of Curtis Wright's aircraft division as a whole, with their repeated failures to break into the late World War II and post-World War II market, Curtis decided to just cut and run, and focus their efforts on parts, supplies, and machinery and the like. While technically Curtis did design the occasional aircraft, after shuttering its aircraft division, the XP-87 was basically their last official full-throated effort. Now, I was going to write how the Black Hawk was more like the Black Sheep, but then I realized that that kind of didn't make sense, really, and I couldn't think of a different way to segue into the ending here. So I guess you can just point and laugh at my inability to think of a different ending transition. All right, and with that, we're going to go ahead and end for today. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Now, I'm still playing Zombie Army 4, I'm playing the DLC, and I like the little Easter eggs and jokes that they pepper in throughout the levels. Like, I found two zombies on a dinner date, some zombies boxing in a cave, and I basically found Plank from Ed, Ed and Eddie. I'm kind of sad that I couldn't bring him with me. I wanted to save my best friend Plank, and I couldn't. Zero out of ten game, wouldn't recommend. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I hope you learned something. So, see ya.